Hello friends, welcome to CEC Live Lectures. Dear friends, uh, as we promised to bring for you different lectures on different subjects, so here we are and uh, today we are going to talk on uh, Mir Nazir and uh, Galeb. Most of our friends uh, might have uh, heard and learnt as well as uh, read more and more about Mir Nazir and Galeb and we believe that through this live session today uh, you would be getting more and more uh, information, more and more uh, knowledge uh, on uh, Mir Nazir and uh, Galeb and for this session we have once again with us in our studios Professor Anand Prakash. Professor Anand Prakash is a retired professor of English and uh, friends uh, Professor Professor Prakash always believes in giving his maximum of his experiences to you students so that you could get in-depth knowledge on various subjects. Friends, if you want to ask questions from Professor Prakash, then you can call straight in the CEC studios. Our toll-free number to contact is one 110 I repeat, our number is one 110 all dear friends are requested to call in the last 10 minutes so that first you could get knowledge on the lecture, knowledge on the topic and afterwards, yes, we promise to give answers to your questions through Professor Anand Prakash. So, uh, I would like to welcome our guest, Professor Prakash once again. Hello, sir. Welcome to the lecture. Thank you, Geetika <coughs> and uh, welcome viewers. Uh, today, we discussed, uh, discuss as been announced by Ms. Geetika, our anchor. Uh, the discussion will be on uh, Mir, Nazir and Ghalib. These three are uh, giants of the 19th century Urdu poetry. Uh, you can call, call it also Hindi poetry because uh, <coughs> before the 19th century, uh, Hindavi was the word used for what we speak today in the name of Hindi, Khadi Boli or Rekhta. Anyway, in this uh, matter, uh, languages don't come, in, come into account, uh, particularly with respect to the uh, subtle variations that each has in, in North India. So uh, we have three poets, uh, Mir, Nazir and Ghalib. And uh, Mir and Nazir uh, uh, were born way back in the 18th century. And uh, both of them happily lived till the 19th century. And uh, they uh, lived a long life. Uh, Ghalib, uh, was born in the last decade of the 18th century and uh, lived beyond 1857, that important year for us. So uh, please keep in mind the background <coughs> that these three poets have. The background of uh, Mir and Nazir is the 18th century life in India. And uh, since both of them were born in uh, uh, higher families and uh, they uh, looked at the world from the angle of those families plus because they were poets, they also looked at the same world from the angle of the common poor masses. The other thing that can uh, in the beginning be said about these, these three poets is that uh, they uh, first were poets, later they were citizens, still later they were scholars, and last they were some kind of dignitaries in their own right in the life that they lived. So because we are, are talking about them as poets, uh, let's uh, concentrate on the qualities that made them poets, the circumstances that compelled them to take to the poetic mold. Uh, first about Mir, uh, Mir is born in <coughs> uh, 1722, 1722, and he lives on till 1810, uh, which means uh, uh, 88 years of uh, life, and most of it was spent. Uh, in the 18th century. And uh, if we look back at the 18th century, we realized that this was not exactly uh, the period of peace and tranquility in which, you know, poets would uh, just enjoy themselves, expressing themselves as poets. It was a topsy-turvy world. It was a world, and particularly Delhi, where, you know, Mir lived all his life. Uh, particularly Delhi was uh, seeing, you know, lots of ups and downs. And there were marauders, there were invaders, there were people who devastated Delhi and who went away after the loot. And uh, Mir was a silent spectator to all this. And sometimes he would save his life uh, by going away from Delhi. Sometimes he would be just lost in the streets of Delhi. And he would, uh, you know, uh, to so to say, uh, miss death 
by inches, by an inch. Uh, one, he, he never knew that he would survive. And he was a fearless man. And he, was, he always kept his eyes and ears open. And he was a sensitive person. So all these things, you know, uh, made him feel as a poet uh, in a very distinct sense. <clears throat> he knew that life and death, uh, you know, were questions just of uh, the idea of the impression that they might have left on him. And uh, therefore, uh, he would uh, take very naturally and spontaneously to that, you know, fine art which is poetry. In poetry, you are a self. In poetry, you are a person. In poetry, you are a feeling individual. And uh, you talk uh, at the level of your heart, at the level of your mind, which is very close to your heart. You uh, share with the audience, if there are audiences, the states of mind that you have. So it's very difficult for a poet to be dishonest. It's very difficult for a poet to, you know, uh, just uh, play a role. A poet has to be that kind of self because the poet is all the time talking to oneself. And Mir was a poet, you know, who in the 18th century when society would not allow even understand what selfhood was. You know that in the 18th century uh, there is a lot of hierarchy in society and family and uh, your role is uh, decided by tradition. If you are a child, if you are a young man, if you are an adult person, if you are an old person, all the roles are well defined in the 18th century. You have to behave like this. But me being a poet would always say, no, I will not behave the way I am expected to behave uh, in the phase of life that I belong to. I will behave in a manner, uh, you know, that uh, allows me to talk about myself and to allows me to talk to myself. So uh, you are talking to yourself and you are talking about yourself. So uh, Mir has that kind of selfhood, that kind of uh, individual identity uh, in the 18th century. And uh, as I talked about the devastations that Delhi saw, was witness to, one realizes that uh, Mir could not but belong to himself because outside there was nothing that was appealing. And uh, if uh, you, know, you looked around, you saw you know, that people were falling on the wayside, that most of them would be cheats, they would be uh, you know, uh, seeing things at the most artificial level, at the level of uh, you know, dress, at the level of money, at the level of property that they had, at the level of wielding social influence that they would hold. And you know all these things come not from you, from your inside, they come from outside. If you, uh, you know, are important and respectable in the family, then uh, you, are, you are so because uh, society compels you to become respectable. If, if, you, if you want money, then society has asked you to amass wealth, to amass money, and then feel happy because you have the money. But uh, Mir, you know, would not uh, identify himself with these things. He would uh, talk about his feelings and states of mind, and states of mind, you know, are, are most important for poetry. So if he saw some bad scene, if he saw some you know, death, if, if, if he saw some cruelty on the streets of Delhi, then he would feel bad. He, he, would, he would hate this kind of a world in which you know, uh, one, one is living, one is breathing. And therefore he would uh, capture the state of mind in his poetry. And uh, his uh, state of mind would not merely reflect the world outside, but his, but his mind will also uh, think about what he, as a, as a human being, would have liked to see. So there is a kind of a gap between what the poet wants to see and, and, and what one actually sees, and that is there in his poetry. Now, uh, <clears throat> uh, maybe uh, in this particular case, uh, I'll, I'll start with his poetry. Uh, I'll be just uh, giving a few examples, one or two examples from his poetry, to just say, you know, that these are the states of mind that the person saw, and uh, one more thing about, uh, uh, you know, Nabir is that he is the maker of what we call Hindi today. And he called it in, the, in, in his own lifetime, Hindi Zubaan. So Hindi Zubaan or later on in the 19th century, this would become Urdu Zubaan, whatever. So uh, he would talk in this language which, which people spoke uh, on the street, which they used in their, in, in the, in their intimate moments in life where they didn't have to show to anybody that they were scholars, they knew this language, they knew that language, uh, whether you know, they knew Persian or they knew Sanskrit, he wouldn't bother about it. He would say, well, this is the word that occurs to me, I'll use that word in my poetry. 
and uh, because he is the maker of uh, Hindi language or Urdu language in the 18th century, uh, therefore he picks up his words from the ordinary masses, from the common masses. In fact, he is able to identify a sort of music in the language of the street. Uh, it's very difficult, you know, to, to find music in the language of the street because the language of the street is dictated by the necessity of the circumstance. But well, if uh, one is uh, being dictated or taking dictations from the necessity of the circumstance, then one is being very natural and uh, one of the ingredients of music is naturalness. So whatever word occurs to you, whatever word occurs to me when I face the world, is the word, you know, that has a music of its own because this word is coming straight from my mind. And if something straight away comes from the mind, then mind has to, you know, uh, use those words in a manner to be true to itself. And that's where the music lies so far as the poetry of uh, this great uh, poet that is me is concerned. <clears throat> now, uh, language by itself is not natural as, as I have indicated. It becomes uh, natural only because the person is perceiving, is, is seeing things or uh, you know, feeding things uh, on, on one's skin, uh, on, uh, on one's nervous system. Because there one feels, therefore the sensitivity of the person is important. And who can be more sensitive than uh, Mir and particularly in the times in which he lived. Uh, I'll just uh, quote a couplet from him and uh, just see you know, the, his uh, way of uh, appreciating uh, the world around him and he is sometimes turning things upside down. He is talking about, for instance, in this uh, couplet that I am going to quote, uh, he is explaining the behavior of nature and uh, where does nature take its behavior from? Uh, please think, uh, where, where, how, how does nature behave in a particular manner and where it takes the, uh, its inspiration or influence from? And very interestingly and very teasingly, our poet says, that nature learns its behavior from human beings. Uh, we, we, we can only say, ha ha, this, this is not possible. A human being is a part of nature. So how come that nature takes its lessons from the human being? But see this uh, couplet and you realize what he means. It's really quite teasing. He says, Khulna kam kam Kali ne sikha hai. Where, where is Kali? Uh, you know, I learned, you know, the, 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 the Khulna. Khulna kam kam kali ne sikha hai unki aankhon ki neem khwabi se. Unki aankhon is the, is the eyes of the beloved and she, she was asleep just a short while ago and now she is waking up and uh, uh, waking up is not straight. Waking up is always in, 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 in some kind of phases. So as, uh, uh, as uh, she was opening her eyes with some effort and opening less and then more and then still more, then Kali saw it and Kali said this is the way to open. So just see the opposite has happened and uh, there is not a single word here that will uh, you know, pose a problem before us. Kulna kam kam kali ne sikha hai unki aankhon ki neem khwabi se. And uh, in English rendering, uh, because for uh, friends, uh, uh, viewers among you uh, who do not follow uh, Hindi, uh, the English rendering is the bud has learnt opening up haltingly, haltingly, uh, the bud opens only haltingly, no, 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 not straight away from the sleepy eyelids of my love. See, see the beauty, see the, see the perception, see, see the softness, the softness of the bud and the softness of the eyes of the beloved, that, that, that there is that kind of a link. And this man, you know, uh, is seeing beauty here. Is there any religion here? Is there any faith here? Is there any ritual here? Is there any orthodoxy here? Is there any manner here? Nothing at all. The poet is talking exactly of the young woman, the beautiful woman, her eyes and the bud. What does it mean? It means that uh, this person doesn't believe in any kind of supernatural power or power, you know, that is there behind uh, all, the, all that we see and what bhakti poets, you know, in the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries would call illusion, maya and all those things. This person in the 18th century has discarded those notions of bhakti where, you know, there was a kind of power that was behind these circumstance or behind the spectacle. What he sees is that there is something in front of him and that thing is to be admired, that thing is to be understood. So if you have to learn living in the present and for the present, if you have to learn to enjoy your know, circumstance, then read Meer. Meer will be telling you that there is beauty scattered all around 
uh, and, and that beauty is to be captured by the poet and see this particular couplet that I quoted to you and where, you know, he's talking about simplicity, he's talking about the actual beauty that is there, uh, you know, in, in front of his eyes. I'll quote another uh, 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 couplet from him and this couplet is uh, uh, very emotional. The, 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 this couplet is very sensuous. It appeals to our senses. It appeals to our sense of beauty in a different manner. It tells us about our body. It tells us, tell, tells us about the magic that the body has or the body can create. And uh, the, the poem is somewhat erotic. It's about love. It's about uh, sensuousness. And just see. And he says there, Tere zulf se ke yaad mein aansu jhamakte hain. Zulf is hair, lock of hair. तेरे जुल्फ से के याद में आंसू झमकते हैं अंधेरी रात है बरसात है जुगनू चमकते हैं और इमेजिन द पोइट इज थिंकिंग ऑफ द ब्लैक हेयर ऑफ द बिलवेड एंड दैट ब्लैक हेयर रिमाइंड्स हर ऑफ द नाइट एंड वेन वेन द नाइट इज देयर इन द माइंड ऑफ द पोइट देन ऑफ कोर्स देर इज कम्प्लीट नाइट इट्स पिच डार्क अंधेरी रात है बरसात है इट्स रेनिंग आउटसाइड and jugnu jhamakte hain and suddenly one sees some light somewhere and the light comes and disappears and that is the end of the couplet what does he mean what he means is that beauty is not there just in the daytime beauty is also there at the night time beauty is not there in daylight beauty is also there when there is no light uh, when, when there is complete darkness and there you know against darkness you have jugnu and 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 that jugnu can be the laughter of the beloved and then jugnu can can be the eyes of the beloved uh, and and all those things and the poet once again is talking about an experience that one has in oneself and uh, you can see that the experiences of the of of the, of the present of all the situation of the moment and uh, be it is lost in that experience i I'll, I'll, i'll explain this after the third thing and uh, a little more and then we can shift to uh, another poet Meer was very fond of calling himself Meer, and he would, in a way, he would not talk to other people. Uh, if if we are, uh, you know, reading his poetry, then we are reading his poetry because he wrote the, that poetry for his own benefit, to to enjoy writing. And we are there on the periphery. All uh, people that admire uh, Meer's poetry are people who are actually overhearing him. He doesn't talk to us. He doesn't talk to me. He doesn't talk to you. He is talking to himself. And sometimes he says so. He says, "Okay, Mir, now listen to me." So Mir splits, uh, you know, his personality into two parts: himself and the person who is called Mir. And uh, this Mir, you know, is is there in the third couplet, uh, directly addressed. And see, Sirhane Mir ke aista bolo. Mir is asleep. Says our poet. Mir is asleep, and please, therefore, just whisper. Do not talk loud. Why? Because otherwise you will disturb him. सो सिरहाने मीर के आहिस्ता बोलो अभी टुक रोते रोते सो गया है वाई इज यू कॉलिंग हिम सर रोते रोते वेल आई ऑलरेडी गिवन द आंसर द आंसर इज दैट देर नथिंग टू लॉफ अबाउट इन द एटीन सेंचुरी एंड ही वुड थिंक ऑफ सर्टन पेंस दोज पेंस कुड बी इंडिविजुअल दोज पेंस कुड बी सोशल देर माइट हैव बिन सम ट्रेजिडी समवेयर एंड ही कुड नॉट पुट अप विद इट and he could not share uh, that pain with others also therefore he slept and uh, when he slept that was just the end of his uh, crying his 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 weeping he, he was weeping but then finally uh, he became calm uh, and and in calmness you know he fell asleep and uh, that sleep is a different kind of sleep you are tired you you are pained you want to get away from the uh, your tragedy or the circumstance and and somehow as you escape it then you fall asleep and this is exactly what meer has said that you know sirhane meer ke aista bolo abhi tuk rote rote so gaya hai now see tuk this word tuk in urdu or this tuk in hindi uh, this tuk is uh, generally spoken uh, by the most common person uh, in a caught in a very common common situation and uh, women you know illiterate women those, those uh, who are confined to homes four walls of the home and uh, they uh, do not have a very rich vocabulary they can't go into the nuances of language and they simply say kutuk took is just now a little while ago just a bit so as you say bit in english so you say took in hindi uh, therefore abhi took 
रोते रोते सो गया है सो इनफैक्ट सोना इज अ इज एन एग्जाम्पल ऑफ हैप्पीनेस बिकॉज बिफोर दैट ही वॉज क्राइंग एंड वंस अगेन सिंप्लिसिटी इज इज द सिंप्लिसिटी ऑफ द लैंग्वेज एज वेल एज द परसेप्शन एंड इन इंग्लिश दिस रेंडरिंग वुड बी फ्रेंड्स टॉक इन हस्ट टोन्स by mere side he has just fallen asleep after sustained crying he was crying all this while and at the end he slept therefore please do not disturb him do not wake him up otherwise he will be up again and he will start crying so these three couplets you know show us the simplicity of the perception but behind the perception there is a kind of a vision that vision is of tranquility that vision is of beauty that that vision is of enjoyment so uh, the enjoyment can be created by the poet at the individual level now <clears throat> uh, the, the point that i am making uh, uh, and which is there at the background of uh, you know what i say is that meer can be termed a visionary a person who, who lives by vision who has a, who has a counter vision to the one that he gets from the circumstance the world around him and uh, that he lives in his own world he lives in his own mind he has created a thing of beauty Uh, uh, you know, the thing of experience in his own mind, and that sustains him, that keeps him alive, that keeps him going, that you know keeps him steady in his life, and it is that vision that is important for him. So he is a visionary. Now, why I use the word visionary? Because you know he he is not going by the rules or rituals or the practices or the manners of bhakti poetry, which was just a few centuries uh, before him, the long tradition. Uh, we have you know uh, lectures in this series uh, on bhakti poetry also but then 18th century is not the bhakti poetry century it's a century that has come out of the bhakti kal that has come out of uh, godliness that comes out of meditation that that that, that has come out of a uh, counter culture to the one that exists around meer has finally attained the level of a vision and that vision is important that vision you know is a kind of connect between uh bhakti kal on the one side and modernity on the other so this vision you know uh, finally will uh, allow the modern sensibility to approach it that will happen at the end of kabir's life uh, as this kabir's life uh, and uh, when i come to nazir then uh, he will also share the vision and galib you know also has that vision so that vision is building up now that vision now is in the uh, process of opening up and uh, this person meer in the 18th century is talking about this vision and that vision actually is the vision of the circumstance around him he is a human being who who is in touch with the world around him and uh, the the human part of it asserts itself against that world and therefore the vision is created i would uh, uh, very clearly uh, emphatically say that this is the humanist vision this is the vision of a human being who wants to live who wants to enjoy who wants to spread the 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 pleasure of you know enjoyment uh, uh, around him so that he can share it with those people who will come in contact with him so vision is the word the, the, that i uh, come to and then i uh, uh, in, in a few minutes now uh, uh, towards the end of the first session uh, of this of this program uh, i'd be introducing uh, the other poet another poet uh, called nazir akbar abadi <coughs> now nazir akbar abadi uh, is an exact contemporary of uh, meer he is also born you know in the uh, in the 18th century and uh, he is born you know uh, in 1735 so he is 13 years younger than 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 meer and uh, why he why why does he call himself akbar abadi because he belongs to agra he was born in delhi then he shifted to agra and then he lived all his all his life in agra and agra became his country agra became his world and uh, he he started calling himself agra ka i am agreka and he you said very clearly and for us he is akbar abadi because akbar you know started the city uh, akbar abad it's called akbar abad agra so he belongs to agra and uh, there he lived all his life and when you read his poetry then you realize that you know th- th- this person actually is agreka he is a product of agra in fact he is not just a product of agreka he is agra himself so that kind of a love he has for agra so he is born in 1735 and he uh, he dies in 1830 95 years uh, me lived for 88 years this person lived for 95 years and uh, the time was the same but his vision uh, i use the word vision 
his vision is, is, is uh, definitely of a different kind. You can see, you know, that uh, uh, when we talk about poetry and when we talk about circumstance and about, you know, conditions of life, then we generally say conditions, you know, uh, make literature. Well, they do in a certain sense. But conditions do not just dictate one kind of literature, one kind of writing, one kind of stance, one kind of attitude. The conditions can be the same. They will be reflected variously in the attitude that the writer evolves uh, in his or her own time. And therefore, the 18th century, which is the producer of both the poets uh, you know, the, 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 that, that will be taking up one after the other, uh, uh, we have had already a view of Mir and now we will be discussing Nazir. So we will see that even though they uh, live in the same world, they live in the same culture, they, they, they have the same kind of people and some of them might be known to one another. Uh, and uh, Mir and uh, Nazir, I, I wonder whether they, they, they would have met uh, you know, uh, on, on, a, on any basis. But that is not important. They share the same culture, the same life, and they have a different attitude to it. Uh, uh, Mir, as I said, is all the time crying, all the time pained. He is an exclusive soul. He moves around the street but does not talk to others. He is a loner. And uh, Akbar Abadi is just the opposite. He is not a loner. He, he doesn't feel lonely at all. Uh, he, in fact, is able to connect vitally uh, with people, you know, uh, among whom he uh, roams. And therefore, uh, one can see that this man is more social, more clubbable, more natural, more spontaneous. And we'll talk about him further in the second half of the lecture. Thank you. With this note, we would like to thank Professor Anand Prakash for giving us a productive session. Friends, we would be uh, meeting again after a short break, so keep watching us. Hello friends, welcome back to this session where we are talking on Mir Nazar and Ghalib and we believe that you might have learned a lot from previous session. In this session also we promise to give you uh, the most of the information as we have with us in our studios Professor Anand Prakash with us. And friends if you want to ask questions from Professor Prakash on today's topic then do call us through our toll free number. Our number is 1-800-110-430. So let's welcome our guest Professor Prakash once again. Hello sir, welcome to the lecture. Yes, friends, uh, now we, uh, as already we have started talking about uh, Nazir Akbar Abadi. So uh, let me uh, this time start not from his poetry, with his poetry, but uh, with the certain comments that people have made about him. And uh, these comments are adulatory. Uh, this person also is a visionary like me, but then he has a different attitude. And uh, how he is different, what emphasis he makes in his poetry how he makes his poetry appealing and social in nature, unlike Veer's poetry, which is not social, which is individual. But this poetry is social. And as to how in the, 19th, in the 18th century, a person was able to create a sense of the social in literature. 
uh, that you know we will consider uh, in brief uh, in the time that we, we have today at our disposal. Now, uh, <clears throat> I am reading out a comment about uh, Nazir. It is said that Nazir Akbar Abadi was perhaps the only poet who reacted to the challenge of the times differently and fell back on the reservoir of his internal strength. He reacts to the 18th century differently than others and then in order to do so, he takes his uh, uh, strength from uh, the, the inner you know, knowledge that he has. He refused to be absorbed with the royalty and the elite and blazed a new trail by addressing himself to the common man, almost completely dissociating himself from the conventional pattern of life, usually followed by the creative artists of his age. It's a very strong statement made about the times in which Nazir Prabhavati lived. All poets would, you know, hanker after reputation, hanker after patronage, and this poet would not care to, so to say, to hoots about what people could give him. He would not take anything from anyone. He was not for any kind of uh, profit or benefit or, uh, you know, any, any help, any assistance. So he was that kind of a poet. And uh, he, for instance, uh, would, would keep a fairly good distance from royalty. People would go to the court regularly. He would never go to the court. And uh, to the elites, you know, that there would be uh, people of the higher class, higher echelons, but he would not have any kind of truck with them. And he blazes a new trail. He, he starts a new tradition uh, in, in Urdu poetry, in, Hindu po in Hindu, Hindi poetry. And that tradition, in fact, will flower, not even in the 19th century, but in the 20th century, well, where you will have different kinds of poets, where they will talk about the people, to the people, and uh, identify themselves <coughs> with them. So it's that kind of a poet. Uh, well, in a slightly light-hearted manner, can we say that uh, Nazir is a socialist poet in the 18th century? Please think about it. This is a question I'm asking uh, from myself and from you, whether it's possible for a poet in the 18th century and 19th century to be a socialist, to be a person who believes in oneness of himself with the audience that he addresses. Now, then this comment continues. Nazir Akbar Abadi is the poet of the people who sang of the people and for the people, though neither a religious mendicant nor a mystic wayfarer. He would not be uh, a religious person. He, he would not be a sadhu, a saint, a mendicant, or just a person moving around. But he would live among the people and he would be one with them. To understand him is to share the treasure of our people's experiences, their moments of joy and jubilation, their toil and tribulation. These are the words that, that, that are being used in order to describe him. This person enjoys the joys of life that he sees in the people around him. And he actually has a kind of inwardness to the experiences that the people around him have. So, their experiences are his experiences. Their joy is his joy. And he expresses that in his poetry. In the background, I continue, in the background of the immortal Taj Mahal, because he lived in Agra, Nazir sang of the much more eternal life for the people and their many splendored life. One is Taj Mahal, it's, it's a many splendored thing, you know that. It is so many splendors, so many shines in, in it. But then he had his own Taj Mahal inside him. And that was much more beautiful than the Taj Mahal in front of him in Agra. So, uh, in the background of the immortal Taj Mahal, Nazir sang of the much more eternal life for the people and their many splendid life. His poems are the modest Taj Mahals, says uh, uh, the, the, the scholar. Uh, many, uh, uh, his poems are the modest Taj Mahals which celebrate his love for masses and give him a unique distinction. In fact, he is a unique person. Of the three poets that we discussed today, Meer before him and Kalib after him, he is the person who identifies himself totally, entirely with the masses of India, with the masses of Agra, and those masses are common masses. Then the third comment, it's, it's, it's of the same part. As a typical specimen of this synthesis, he, he actually has a synthesis, but that synthesis may not be exactly the kind that will do justice to him. Unity of thought between Hindi and Hindu and Islamic mysticism, that's what people can say. 
that there are Hindu mystics and there are Muslim, uh, Islamic mystics, and that there is synthesis in him that is said, and Sufi and Bhakti movement, that there is a kind of synthesis there also, that is pointed out, but uh, the, the commentator, the analyst, uh, you know, uh, doesn't uh, that way uh, agree with them. Uh, I'm referring to Muhammad Hassan, uh, the, the critic in the, uh, 80th, the 20th century, who talks, uh, who says these words, because for him, Nazir was a product of the feudal system, which had not yet alienated the working classes from the joys of living. Feudal system was, of course, very bad. It was very oppressive. It was very hierarchical. But then, feudal system also had masses. And sometimes there was some kind of interaction between the top people and the masses. But then, if you remove the top people and think only of the masses in the feudal system, then that is what helps us understand Nazir better. And uh, Nazir was a product of the feudal system, which had not yet alienated the working classes from the joys of living. Working classes in feudal system sometimes could enjoy. Let's say there the, is the change in season. Let's say sometimes the prices of goods have fallen and goods are aplenty in the market and they can enjoy. When the uh, you know, uh, festivals come, when uh, other occasions come of get together, of, at that point of time, people start enjoying each other's company, one another's company. And uh, it is this company that Nazir would identify himself with. He will also enjoy along with the common people. And common people had some moments in the feudal system uh, you know, when they would be entirely on their own. And uh, who are the common people for him? They are not abstract common people. Like we, we say, we, we use the word common people again and again, but don't have any idea of who the common people are today. But in the case of uh, uh, Nazir, the common people stand completely identified. Who are they? They are craftsmen, people who you know, work with hands, with tools. There are artisans who work also for the market. Then there are seers. You know, in the feudal system in villages, you have some people who are, who are wise, who, who, who are intelligent. Uh, who are, you know, uh, uh, so to say, slightly holy in, in their nature. They, they don't take direct interest and they are not moved by uh, common, you know, benefits of life. And they are seers and they are minstrels, people who sing around, move and, you know, uh, entertain people. It is these, you know, uh, in whom uh, uh, Nazir takes interest and he sometimes joins his voice with their voice and he talks like them and uh, because they enjoy because they celebrate, so he also starts celebrating. It's that kind of a poet. And then uh, says Muhammad Hassan, Nazir stood as a modest, unambi un unambitious soul. A person you know, who is born in uh, higher circles uh, finally leaves all that, lives in Agra, uh, looks around and, and, and talk, talks about these people. This is something that you know one has to understand in the case of uh, uh, Nazir Akbarabadi. And uh, when there are festivals, uh, Nazir will talk about the festivals, uh, the way people get together, they, they, the, the way they sing and dance. And when they sing and dance, which myths, which legends are, uh, do they you know, equate themselves with? Uh, which are the gods that, 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 that they evoke? Which, which are the traditions, so to say, uh, that, that they evoke? And in that case, you know, Nazir will not make any distinction between one faith and another. Because for, for him, religion is not important, Islam is not important. Hinduism is not important. For him, what is important is the subject of discussion, the subject of uh, a celebration that common masses have. So he, he'll go by the selection and the, uh, you know, picking up by the common masses of the things that, you know, make them enjoy. And of course, when there is a holy festival and, or when there is Eid and when there are other festivals, then people get together and they start enjoying. So for him, enjoyment is important. This is to be kept in mind. You know, that he just picks up those details, he picks up those myths like Krishna legend, the Krishna myth, that, that there is Lord Krishna. So he would easily you know, talk about Krishna and his bhakti and he will become a bhakt because he sees around him people who have faith in Krishna. In the same way, if people have faith in another festival, then, then he would go and say, okay. And uh, you know, he would not name even the festival so much. He, he might think of only, only of the seasons like Basant. So he'll, he'll write a poem about Basant. And because uh, Basant means pile kapde and ye yellow clothes, and Basant means you're moving around and dancing, and this is, Basant is the, the, the month of February and March, and uh, people, you know, are out of the, uh, you know, the, the winter, uh, wintry, uh, you know, cold. Therefore, he will say, okay, now this is Basant, and let's enjoy it. 
rains and you would enjoy it again. If there, if there are people who are selling wares in the market and they are small, small scale wares, you know, for instance, he goes to a, a, a village fair and then you see children, you know, asking for this thing or that thing, then he will talk about children. If, if, if some animal is being, uh, you know, uh, kept to entertain the people in the fairs, then he will talk about the animal. Uh, he will talk about the bear, the, the reach. And in fact, there is a famous poem called Reach Ka Bacha. And it's such a beautiful poem, you know, uh, that, that is written. And just because he saw that, uh, you know, uh, spectators had uh, assembled around the reach and they were seeing the tricks that uh, the, the reach was showing and the, the owner of the, of, of the, of the beer was, uh, you know, using. So he'll start enjoying it like this. And uh, there are, you know, lot, lots of stories about him. One story is that uh, uh, one day uh, a, a small scale, you know, uh, seller of, of goods uh, could not sell them and uh, no, uh, you know, uh, uh, customer would approach him and he was passing by and he said, what is your problem? He said, nobody came today to, to buy my wares. And this person said, okay, I'll give you a song. You start singing the song and the customers will come to you. And this man said, okay, please help me. So he sits down, he writes the song and he gives it to him. And he says, now shout this song, sing this song and the customers will come. So he, he, he uses that song and customers start coming. So just see, you know, that he's moving around uh, and, and uh, he, he's, he's uh, laughing and uh, he's, a, he's a poet of the street and that way, you know, uh, he, he's able to start a trend. I'll just uh, quote uh, one, uh, you know, uh, a poem, short poem by him. He's written long poems also. In fact, one of the poems that, that, that uh, 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 is famous, uh, he's famous for, uh, that poem is about Agra. Agra, you know, is visited by economic crisis and uh, there, is, there is poverty all around. And this person is very unhappy. You know that people, uh, the, the, uh, the sellers and the buyers, they are not seen in the market. So where should people go? So he writes about that Agra, you know, which was struck by the economic crisis. That's a long poem. So uh, that poem you should read uh, whenever you're on occasion. It's, it's available uh, in translation. Uh, it, it's, it's there in Urdu. It's there, there also in Hindi. And uh, parts have been translated in English. So you, you can perhaps read that poem. And he's very angry, you know, with, with the makers of, because economic crisis doesn't happen on its own. Somebody, uh, some force would be there behind the economic crisis. So that, that he's also angry, you know, that, that uh, people are di dying and starving and some others would be taking money out of it. So that kind of a poet who is one with the sufferers, one with people, you know, who, who, who are denied uh, the, the, the ordinary comforts of life, He's one with them, therefore he's their poet. So anyway, uh, I'll just uh, uh, give an example of uh, uh, a poem by him. It's called uh, a poem about Kore Bartan. Kore Bartan hai kyari Bartan ki, jisse khilti hai har kali tan ki, boond pani ki unme jab khan ki, kya wo pyari sada hai sansan ki, tazgi dil ki aur tari tan ki, wah kya? Bath Kore Bartan Ki. This is the song that he has sung uh, somewhere in the 18th century, 19th century. Uh, and then, you know, uh, he, this is, all the words are taken from the street. All the words can be sung easily. It, it's a kind of a holy, it's a kind of a kajri, it's a, it's a kind of, you know, poetry where people just want to express their emotions irrespective of, uh, you know, the, the word, you know, that, that uh, they would be using, because those words come natural to them. And the English rendering is, new earthen vessels are the flower beds of a garden. Now just see, are they vessels or are they flower beds? He is calling the earthen vessels as one with the flower gardens, flower beds of the garden, which make the bud of every heart blossom forth. See the metaphor. The metaphor is of the, of, of the uh, you know, uh, earthen vessels and uh, they, uh, you know, metaphorize the flower beds. And then uh, the, uh, the, it's further extended to the uh, bud of every heart blossom. When the drop of water falls on it, on what? On the carry, on the flower beds, on the flower, or on the vessel, or on tan. Just see the, 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 the uh, metaphor. The metaphor covers all these things. When the drop of water falls on it, how scintillating a music it produces. Now, music uh, being produced by the drop of the uh, water or, uh, you know, on, on, on the vessel is one kind of thing. 
another thing where when it you know for falls in the body of a person so imagine that uh, the the vessel and uh, and the, the body they have become one here and uh, he he has that you know idea he, he has the knack of you know using old words in the new context the, the old context was the, the in fact the tan also was a bartan in in bhakti poetry you can say that uh, the uh, tan means body body is an instrument and here you know tan is a bartan and see the beauty of the word bartan and tan they, they, they are the same thing refreshers of heart and mellowness to body heart and body you know both are subjects of a depiction here oh what to say of a new pot i will just see the word pot the word pot can be the actual earthen vessel earthen pot it can also be the, the human body and it also can be a flower and when you think of the human body and the flower then you can also think of softness so you can see the kind of you know uh, sensuousness the kind of softness the kind of you know charm and magic this person can create the kind of wonder you know that, that, that he can create in the most ordinary thing in life so this is the poet for us and uh, i i just use this example to tell you that it's a different kind of poetry than any other poet in the 18th and 19th centuries and uh, he is totally with the the language of people uh, that they speak in their actual situations and conditions and that uh this poem can be you know uh, understood by a 10 year old it can also be uh, interpreted very deeply by a scholar of 40 or 50 years so that kind of poetry and to see the range and i would definitely say that is much before his time this kind of poetry would be written in the 20th century and later this is the poetry that will be written in countries where already equality has been established and people have started enjoying art he is that kind of poet so i would straight away say uh you know without with without you know any 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 you know idea that uh, it will be uh, unacceptable that this poet belongs to society and you can easily earn the epithet socialist for him so uh viewers the, uh, the in, the, in this particular poet you will see uh, your own pictures of mind my own pictures of mind and that we relate directly to this poet and uh, language does not matter to him any language that is on the street if he is in agra he speaks the language of agra if you are in delhi he would speak the language of delhi if he were in deccan he would speak the language there so wherever he was he would try to make un- people understand his intent his message his his sense of joy in the language that other people would understand so we have this nazir akbar abadi for us and i'm sure uh, this he is an underrated poet because people do not talk about him as much as they talk about other poets of his time uh well that is our uh, you know uh, problem not his problem he enjoyed his life and uh, he was born in a in a high family uh, in the family of nawabs he also married in the family of nawabs but he would not go near the court he would always remain on the street sometimes he would even sleep on the street he would talk to the people he would talk to women he he, he would you know see them dancing he would sometimes you know tell them how to dance he, he was a great artist so he was a, he was a person you know who had all the qualities and yet his life was totally devoted to the pleasures and pains of people uh, that, that that surrounded him the third poet uh, that we have is galib on galib we have had lectures in other under other series also and uh, galib is a you know name that is now known all over the world he is available in uh, translation in different languages in the world and uh, uh, so far as he is concerned he is a direct successor to these two poets he may not have met uh, 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 meer uh, he was uh, you know 13 when meer died uh, uh, meer died in 1810 and uh, ghalib was born in 1797 so he would have been 13 and uh, uh, i i read somewhere some references that uh, ghalib when he was 12 or so he started he, he composed some verses and he sent them to uh, uh, meer and meer was uh, very near his death then so he looked at the verses and uh, uh, meer said about ghalib that uh, i wish this, this this boy had been born a little earlier and uh, i was in touch with him in that case i would have told him how to use his talent in a manner that you that that would you know out uh, excel the the uh, genius of all others he saw that you know seed of uh, talent uh, in ghalib at that time ghalib was 11 or so and uh, he was able to uh, see his poetry 
whether this is true or not, because <coughs> it's not authenticated, it's, it's just a kind of a telltale, but definitely Ghalib had started writing early and Mir uh, would be aware of uh, who was doing what, because Ghalib had connection with Delhi and uh, Mir always lived in Delhi. Uh, sometimes he would go outside, but generally he would live here. So they were in touch. So far as Nazir uh, uh, Akbarabadi is concerned, uh, Ghalib uh, would have definitely met him, I'm sure. Why? Because Ghalib was regularly visiting Agra and Ghalib for some time also lived in Agra. So uh, Nazir was there uh, you know, in Agra uh, till 1822, that's the date I think I, uh, 18, uh, that is May and uh, 1830. So Ghalib definitely would have met uh, Nazir. Uh, the two did not uh, share the tastes. Ghalib uh, belonged to the world of sophistication. He, he belonged to the world of, uh, you know, scholarship, to, to the world of uh, geniuses. And he was very witty. Not that uh, Nazir was less witty, I'm not saying that. But then the areas of interest of uh, Ghalib and Nazir would be different. And uh, that would, you know, keep them apart. Anyway, they, they, they join in the tradition uh, uh, to which uh, all belong and I'll make a few general points about Ghalib before I come to the end of this discussion today. Ghalib had this unique distinction of being witness to what happened in 1857, the, the first war of independence as we call it. Uh, Ghalib was in Delhi, Ghalib saw the happenings on the street, the street fights he saw, he saw murder, mayhem, he saw mass killings. He was himself uh, would have been killed in one of the, uh, you know, uh, incidents. Uh, he was captured and uh, he, he was, uh, you know, brought before the firing squad. He somehow saved himself, which means that he saw, uh, you know, reputation. He saw, uh, you know, praise in Delhi. Uh, he was uh, uh, taking part in the, uh, you know, uh, mahfils in, in, in Red Fort, where Badr Shah Zafar would, would be, you know, the would, would be the king. And he was in King's company, so that kind of uh, you know, splendor he saw. At the same time, he saw destruction and he saw poverty. Because in post-1857, Ghalib uh, could not live properly. He could not eat properly. As he, would, he was sometimes starving also. And uh, the kind of uh, scarcity uh, you know, that, that he faced in life, that, that, that can't be imagined for, for a person like Ghalib. So Ghalib saw all this happening in front of his eyes. And uh, lucky for us today, uh, ironically, of course, lucky for us that he has left an account of 1857 in one of his books. Uh, he was clever, he was intelligent not to have written, uh, you know, the, the, that particular account uh, in, in Urdu because that would have, you know, made him uh, a kind of suspect in the eyes of uh, the, the Britishers in the eight, in, in 1850s and 60s. Therefore, he wrote it in Persian and uh, that, that, that was, that could be translated and uh, could be circulated, but not many would read what had actually happened in 1857, but luckily for us, we have, uh, you know, a book uh, done by him in Persian, it's called the Stambu, and now it's available both in English and, and, and in uh, Hindi translation, so we can read it, but then Ghalib can also be called a social historian, because what he saw in 1857, that's what he put it down in, in, in this book. Then, you know, he starts Urdu criticism, Urdu doesn't have a sense of criticism. At that point of time, criticism means literary criticism. Uh, in the 19th century, Hindi doesn't have, other languages also do not have the kind of criticism we have today. But then uh, it comes, it goes to the credit of Ghalib to start discussing literature seriously in the 19th century. And that he does in his letters to his friends. And uh, his, uh, we have had other lectures elsewhere. And uh, his letters, you know, are a, are a treasure house of uh, you know, ideas and insights about uh, poetry, about literature. And uh, Ghalib left a large number of letters. They are available today in English translation also. And uh, Ghalib that way is a father of modern Urdu criticism. So apart from being a great poet, he is also a critic in his own right. And he starts the tradition of discussing uh, intelligently and deeply the issues of art and that he does in his letters. Ghalib has that kind of modern sensibility which straight away uh, helps us uh, equate ourselves with him, which is true also about uh, Nazir and Mir. They also have that, that modernity. And uh, as I explained in the early part of the lecture, their modernity is actually in the seed form when they start living in their present, irrespective of what reference they make to other things. In fact, they, he, uh, these two poets did not make any, any reference to 
uh, you know, uh, the uh, uh, thing beyond this world. So that was perhaps the idea, that was the background against which modernity will flower. And in the case of Ghalib, because he comes later, that modernity has come to its fruition. So we have a modern mind. We have a person who looks not merely at the present, he also looks towards the future. And he thinks that the future, and he said it in, in his letters, and he has also said in his poems sometimes, uh, he thinks, you know, that the future lies with, uh, you know, uh, education, the, 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 the future lies with science, the future lies with query, experimentation. He says that this is a modern thing. A person, you know, uh, who would be steeped in uh, the, the classics of uh, Persian and Arabic, saying, you know, that the future lies in science is something, you know, that, that, that should uh, make all, all of us, you know, uh, understand the depth of his uh, understanding. And uh, he's, he's more than a visionary then. He is a person, you know, who, who looks towards the future. And that's, that's where, you know, Gaudi, uh, Ghalib is completely outstanding. Then, you know, the last point that I make about Ghalib, and that then we come to the end of the discussion, is that he, in a way, revolutionizes Ghazal. His, his Ghazals are remarkable, and people are, are, are these days sing, you know, one Ghazal after another Ghazal. But he's not writing the traditional conventional Ghazal. He never wrote. Uh, you know, Ghazal has this uh, particular, uh, you know, uh, characteristic, a uh, particular feature of uh, having, you know, in, in the same meter and in the same order, uh, different couplets. But those couplets, you know, don't, don't, don't join together. Those are independent couplets. That, that's, the, you know, that, that's the beauty, that's the feature of uh, Ghazal. Uh, Ghazal starts sometime in the 11th, 12th century, and it comes up to the 18th, 19th centuries. Uh, different couplets of the Ghazal, they always remain independent. They don't join with each other. And Ghalib was the first one uh, to effectively put most of the couplets of the Ghazal in one unified form, in one kind of a thread. And uh, that's where, you know, he made Ghazal very, come very close to a poem where thematically there will be a connection between this couplet and that couplet. So, uh, and he was, uh, and uh, because Ghazal uh, is defined ideally as something that talks about beauty. Ghazal means, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a sense of beauty. Uh, it, it, the, the, uh, the beauty of the eyes of the deer, that, that, that's what the Ghazal is. Hirni ki aankh ki se Ghazal hoti hai. That, that, that's what they say. But Ghalib said, no, Ghazal is to be, is to be a vehicle of ideas. He will not write a Ghazal which expresses beauty. He will write a Ghazal which will compel you to think, which will also tell you about the pain. He will tell you about bitterness. Will he tell you about anger? He will say all this. So therefore, many people didn't even recognize him as a good Ghazal writer. But Ghalib would not bother. So there were critical attacks on Ghalib, and they would say uh, that they, they, they will, you know, tear him to pieces. And that famous thing, and Ghalib said, okay, I'm coming to you, I'll read my ghazals to you, and please tear me to pieces. And in one of the ghazals he says this, but tamasha na hua. Nobody could come, actually, and do this. So uh, we have these three poets, uh, uh, friends, and we come to the end of the discussion. And I say that these are three pillars of the 18th and 19th century uh, poetry in India, and that uh, they are available, luckily, for us in English translation. So uh, you should be reading them, and you should enrich yourself, uh, your sensibility, and see how, whether we, you know, uh, prove them to be right, because they had uh, faith in future, and we are their future. So let's at least agree that we'll be, uh, you know, uh, uh, taking appeal from what they expected of us. Thank you. Well, listen, thank you, sir. Thank you so very much for uh, giving us a vivacious session where we learned about the three uh, poets um, who uh, brought through their poetry the philosophy of life. Uh, friends, we believe that the lecture might appear very, very beneficial to you. And if you feel so that you have any feedbacks or any questions, then do write to us at info.cec at nic.in. Your questions are welcome and we'll try to give answers to your questions when next time. Professor Anand Prakash visits our studio. Till then, take care, goodbye, and yes, keep watching us and keep writing us. Thank you, sir. Thank you once again.